So I think um, given the recording has just started and um, just for the sake of the recording, um, welcome to the working group for the Tadwig Mids task group. Working meeting, isn't it? Working, working meeting. So, um, so it's great. So we'll give people a, a chance to, to arrive. And uh, thank you, Matthias, for the um, the info and the, you'll go do a demo. Perfect. And we've prepared a um a shared document to put some notes and things into as well. <coughs> uh, oops. So I'll just I'll share that with everyone. Um, it says access denied. Oh, yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> Oops. It's a very exclusive group notes. <laughs> For only Elspeth and I can modify it. <laughs> Let's see what we can do. Uh, any of the link can edit. Oh, cool. Now that should now work. And I'm just going to really share it just to be sure. Yeah, I'm seeing people in it now. This is looking good. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I guess while we're waiting for people to, you know, any anyone else to show up, just the heads up, if I randomly disconnect, it's because, you know, Hurricane Nicole is passing over. And uh, you know, so far, so good. I'm not worried. But if I just randomly drop out, it's not personal. It's because the internet or the power got knocked out by the storm. You've, you've been having a lot of storms. Yeah, yeah. We just had Hurricane Ian, like, not even two months ago. Yeah. And having a storm this late in the season is really unusual. Uh -huh. No. Yeah, it's not. It's not. Not great. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not. It's not great. Thankfully, it's it's on, only a category one, and it, by, at this point, it's a tropical storm now. But it can still knock out the power. So fingers crossed. Well, it's just it's slightly windy here, but that's all. <laughs> yeah, it's very windy outside here. <laughs> so I don't know if anyone else is coming or if we can just make a start i think we we look at making a start um <clears throat> which point of course someone arrives <laughs> yeah I'll, I'll keep an eye on like the waiting room and stuff you know I'll, i can admit people it's no problem cool um so yeah so it's great it's it's lovely to see some i mean not as it's nice not nice to see the same people but it's lovely to see some new people as well <laughs> So um, yeah, welcome. Um, so we've got a kind of rough agenda um, for for the for the meeting, and what we thought we'd do is to take the opportunity to kind of just kind of raise our heads up a bit, have a have a look to see where we are, <clears throat> review the work that we've done over the past year, um, and then have a um, bit of discussion about mapping, which uh, Matty is going to just um, maybe do a, a demo and have a do some thinking about the mapping side of things. Um, and then we thought once we've done that, we can then have a look at some of the, the discussion about the elements and see where we are, where we are with those and whether we can kind of broadly sign off um, mid levels zero to two in terms of content um, and what what work is still needed. And then have a look at next steps. Um, maybe think about the structure of GitHub to help us structure structure our progress um, with use of milestones, etc. Um, and then really thinking about how we want to progress in terms of um, the specification and, and the ratification process. 
So that's kind of broadly what we wanted to cover. It's probably, I don't know if it's overly ambitious, but we can, we can try. Um, but the first thing I'd like to do is um, just do a kind of summary of where we are in terms of the, 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 um, the work over the past year and where we're, where we're kind of sitting now. So <clears throat> for this, I've got a, I've got a presentation. I'm going to try and go through it fairly quickly because I don't want to use up all our time with, with this. Um, but I think it would be hopefully useful and, um, we can also, um, have a think, make, make some notes, um, from this as well. So, um, slideshow and then share screen. Cool. So just to have um, a kind of um, whistle stop tour through um, through the the mids um, specification and the different levels. <clears throat> this is kind of where we're sitting at the moment. Um, so we've got the the four levels mid zero one two and three. Um, we've got some kind of um, proposed agreement um, on the different elements within each of these um, levels up to up to mids level two. Mids level three is still very much kind of um, to be discussed um, what that looks like. So um, what I've done, so I'm going to move this out of the way so I can, there's a thing on the screen here. Um, what I've done is try to kind of show what we're looking at in terms of the, the, the structure of each of these elements. And this is something that we may want to change. There might be some th information in here that we, we are missing that we need to put in. There might be some things that we aren't, aren't needed that we can delete. <clears throat> but essentially what we've got is um, we've got the, 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 um, the information element. And one thing to think about here is, is the, the term that we're using, the name that we're using for each of the elements. And are we using the right terms? Should we be um, using existing terms where appropriate um, rather than um, making up new terms? which aren't necessarily needed. So that's that's kind of something we need to be thinking about for that. Um, purpose, we put in purpose just really to help with clarifying the, the definition mapping and recommendations. It really kind of focuses, um, focuses our, the discussion um, on, on each of the elements and on why we're actually, why it's there and what it's, what it's trying to do. Um, the definition aim obviously is to try and make this as clear as possible. There's more work needs to be done on the definitions. Um, mapping, what we're doing with this um, is using the, the, the concept of exact, exact mapping and broad mapping. That's working, I think, really quite well for us. I think it's made things a lot easier for us to, to, to work with that kind of, those concepts. Um, we're currently aiming to map to Darwin, uh, Dublin Core, Darwin Core, ABCD, the schema.org is, is in there. Um, but what else? Is there other things that we need to be thinking? And I think Matt is going to talk more about mapping as well. Um, recommendations and applicable standards. Um, this is particularly important, I think, for the lower levels, mid zero um, and one in particular, but obviously mid two as well, where the elements are less prescriptive, they're quite generalized. Therefore, I think the recommendations are going to be really important to try and help guide people in the right direction. Um, the things like element identifier, we've not really discussed. Um, the idea of requirements, um, what we've done there is we've brought in these three different kinds of requirements. So the requirement for biological, geological and paleontology paleontological um, and with the aim to align these three requirements at the lower levels but that they they start to come in they kick in at the higher levels I think uh, repeatable constraints um, and examples they they all really need some work <clears throat> and then we've got the element specification status. So this is kind of the, the, the a bit of an overview of, of each element and what how we're constructing each element. 
So I'm just going to run through the elements that we've got and what they look like at the moment. <clears throat> In terms of um, mid zero, we've got the, the mids up at the top, top right here. Um, for the mid zero, we've essentially just got two information elements. One is the physical specimen ID. Um, and I'm not going to go into a lot of the detail here. People can look into this and follow up um, and we can go into for discussion later on, we can go into this in more detail. Um, there wasn't, I don't think there was much um, controversy over this one, so I'm going to skip over it. Um, organization, um, this was started off as two, a kind of information element with two subparts, and that was the the name and the referent or the the identifier. And what we've done is we've we've simplified this, um, so this is now just a sim single element and it's a fairly generalized one just called organization um, and that's really come from the schema.org and um, then we move into mids level uh, one um, so obviously this builds on mid zero so it includes the two elements in mid zero um, and then again we've the concept here is we've we've gone for quite generalized terms and concepts um, to make it to, to make the barrier to this as low as possible to so that people can actually um, achieve mids level one without too much too much work. Um, this is really designed for these um, mass digitization programs, so we want the ones that have already occurred. We feel they should be able to achieve mids level one. Um, Specimen type. Now, this is where most of the discussion over the past year, I would say, is, is, and, and, and before, <laughs> has taken place um, with specimen type and object type. So this kind of some kind of descriptive terms for what the specimen is. This has been a huge amount of discussion here. And eventually we've, we've kind of settled on two, two elements within um, MIDS 1. And one is the um, specimen type which is kind of at a very high level it's kind of the idea of basis of record um and it's going to i think be um it'll map to a um, material sample type as well so there's we, we're keeping an eye on on material sample group um and we're also been been taking into account the work of the eye sample um so that's that's kind of things that we've been we've been looking at and it's kind of this balance between what collections are actually recording and what's ideally wanted in the future and this idea that actually probably in the future we're going to want to have um some some good terms here with good controlled vocabulary but i we, the feeling is we're not there yet um but this is hopefully trying to kind of pull us towards um, a direction of travel with these two with these two um, elements. So as I say, specimen type and object type. An object type is being the more um, um, informative, um, and it's broadly mapping to, for example, um, Darwin core preparations and the ABCD kind of unit. So. Um, and we've got some idea of what the, the purpose of this is for as well. Um, I think one thing we've noticed in, for example, in GBIF and things is, is that, that people are using different mapping. We need to kind of try and encourage standardized mapping and that goes for all of these, all of these elements. Um, license again, I think was fairly uncontroversial. Um, so this needs obviously needs um, a bit more work, but it's essentially the recommendation to use CC and license framework. Um, and then modified being the last element in MIDS level one. So it's kind of essentially seven elements within MIDS level one. Um, and originally it was it was considered to, to include it in MIDS level zero, but it was it was decided just for it to start in MIDS level one. <clears throat> Um, then we go into mids level two, and then we hit geography because this this was another area of of a of lot of discussion, um, and there was the eventual kind of decision to to include two 
basic terms for for geography. One was a qualitative location um, for for text strings and human readable um, information, and then the the second one being the quantitative location, um, which was much more about machine readability. So those are the two terms for geography that we have, um, and they're both quite um, generalized as well within this level two. Um, then this is where um, some of the discussion I said before about um, the required um, status and, and with stratigraphy, um, the idea that this was recognized as a critical element for geology and paleontology. Um, so we can see it's required, but only for, for these two um, disciplines. Um, and this is where we're seeing the kind of um, a similar thing here for, for some of the information about the collecting event, and that's particularly the, like the who collected it, when it was collected, um, and what, what number was assigned to the, to the collection. So these were considered to be critical for biology, for example. So we've got these three um, in here. So we've got the, um, the, the collector, who collected it, we've got the date, and we've got the collecting number. So these three elements were considered to be um, critical for biology, um, not necessarily required for the, for the other two. Um, type status has been a, a, a difficult one. Um, and at the moment, what the proposal is to move this to mids level three. Um, and just leaving mass as the, I think the, I think the last element for, for mids, oh no, it's one more element for mids level two. And again, um, not required for all. And the last one was, was media. There had been a lot of discussion about um, image. Um, and when and how it should be included. At one point, we had this as a separate kind of um, add-on for each of the, the levels. Um, and then it was decided that it would only really come in at mids level two. So mids level one does not need an image. Um, they, they just need the, the data elements. Um, but when we get into mids level two, then an, uh, um, an image or, or media is required, but at present it's really um, being proposed that it's just for bio, uh, bio, biology rather than all three. So that is where we are. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, let's see a very quick um, overview of the of the mids elements and and where we are with those um i'm just aware that those are in a folder that people aren't going to be able to see so i'm just going to um just bear with me i'm just going to um put the link to that spreadsheet i just did a sorry the um presentation into the into the shared document um so that if people want to go back and have a look at where we are, um, then you can do that. So I'll just put that link in here. Um, <clears throat> super. So I guess, first off, bearing in mind that we're going to be um, having some discussion about these elements. This isn't the only time to have any discussion about them. Are there any, are there any questions at this point in time? Has, does anyone think I've missed anything? <laughs> oh, that's a good point. Yes, do do use the chat for questions. Cool. So well, hopefully that's that's been useful. Um, the one other few other things just to point out. One is um, a lot of the work that we've been doing 
is um, is in the GitHub, and I put I put links in the in the in the document as well. But I'm just going to put them in the chat here. Um, so um, the mids elements are all um, were created as issues in in the in the GitHub, um, and that's where you can see some of the discussion that's taken place over for each of these elements as well. Um, so you can see what kind of discussion that there's been for some of them. Um, and do feel free to add comments in there as well. Cool, so I think to make best use of our time, I'm going to go straight over to, to Matthias to have a, have a look at mapping um, and where we are with mapping and some of the things that we want to be thinking about mapping. And I hope that fits with what you're planning to do. <laughs> Um, yes, yes, thank you, Elspeth. Um, I don't want to make this too long because I want to have as much time for discussion as possible, as this is still a working session. Um, so I'm not going to present the app. I've already done that. I think most people will have already seen it. And I can link to some documentation in the shared document, or you can just email me if you have any questions about it. I wanted to focus um, mostly for this session on the mapping itself. So the general idea that I wanted to make possible is that I wanted a script, more or less, that calculates MITs for you. So you can just take a data set, run the script, and you have the scores, and you can do this repeatedly. You can do this for lots of data without having to go to curators and ask them to make some sort of guesstimate of what they think their collection statistization status looks like. And what's needed for that is some sort of explicit mapping between the elements that we've described and different standards, but in particular, we're focusing on Darwin Core because that's the most commonly used one. So I'll share, I can't share my screen. <laughs> You'll have to adjust. Them. So uh, I should be able to give you permissions for that. Um, one sec. So no. yeah, it's, it's set to all participants. You should be able to share your screen. Yeah, I just I just changed it so that should work now. Thanks. Okay. Now it's working. Uh, okay. So I think anybody can see my screen now. I can okay. see it. Okay. Thanks. So this is the JSON schema that I made for the for this. So what it it's a very simple thing. Um, it lists the sort of unacceptable values. So these are unknown values, which we do not consider to be sufficient for a positive MITS score, but we don't have to discuss those today. That's a separate thing. And then it lists for each MITS level. So this goes cumulatively um, for each element, the specific Darwin core mappings with some potential logic attached to it um, as well. Matt, Matthias, can I ask a favor? Could you just zoom in slightly? Thank you. Um, and with this, it's actually rather easy afterwards to calculate mid scores based on the schema. And it's easy to, to adjust if uh, some, if we discuss that some mappings are not ideal, or if some contexts require some different mappings, as we've talked about before, for differences for botany um, and for geology and paleontology. And it's something that's easily shareable and reusable regardless of the actual script and how it's implemented. So this was the idea that I had to simply and explicitly make the mappings, but of course, at some point beyond, I have to make the have a discussion of how we, what decision we actually make about which mappings we hold through. And this one in particular has some has a specific context. It's mostly geared towards GBIF annotated Darwin Core archives. 
for a few reasons. It can probably be generalized to um, Dorico archives as a whole, but there are other standards out there still, and that's another thing to do. And we will need different schemas, as I said earlier, for the different disciplines as well. So what I would um, like to do in this session, I hope that it's all in JSON, but I hope it's because it's not particularly complicated, but it's all pretty clear what the meaning is. But what I wanted to do is have an open discussion on some of these mappings, what could be different, and for some problematic terms, if we need an alternative solution, or if this is, as an, in general, a good idea going forward or not. No, I think I think it's um, I think it's really good to, to bring this in at this stage of the of the working meeting because I think what we're going to want to do is maybe think about this kind of all the way through the meeting. So we may go on to different topics, but if we can always be thinking about this as we're as we're discussing, I think it would be really helpful. Um, yeah. but having some discussion, more discussion now, I think would be good. Yeah, for, so for some mappings, it's pretty straightforward. But if you go up, like for location, I've made some proposals, but you have different possibilities. Um, so here, you have different properties that all need to be present to make it sufficient for MITs. That may be farther than we want to go. But at the same time, we also do want to enforce some rigor in, in MITs as well, because otherwise it's not going to be a useful standard. There should be, so we're working on a section for the TED, which is basically recommendations for things. And one of them is going to be Scott mappings about how to sort of handle that kind of thing. And so, and I hope, hope have that done by the end of the year. So it should help. It's not like it's, it's not um, like a normative thing where you have to sort of follow, but it's just a general, Guidelines, if you're going to map terms, here's some general ideas and terms to use and formats just to make things, to expedite things when people sort of work on this. Yeah, that, that would also be helpful if you have general um, remarks on the whole structure of the schema, yeah. what could be better, because this is, I mean, it's, it's still essentially something that we quickly put together to make something work. And if there was something everybody just could look at, like, hey, it, this part's already done for you. Just if you follow this, it's great. And you could just skip that step. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Just get like right to it instead of having sort of search for stuff like that. Have you guys thought about um, if I were to ask you what is level two? Is there a, a definition for it? Like, a, what is level three? What is level two? In the sense that, you know, if something, if the spec, you know, for record or something is level two, I can expect X, Y, and Z. Right. If it's level three, or maybe it's it's based on purpose. Like if it's level two, you can do this with it. If it's level three, you can do this with it. Has that been sort of hammered out at all? Where sort of like the goals of those three levels are? Like it's like an elevator, like a what's the level two? And it's four sentences. I mean, it's probably, it's, probably, it's, a high, it's a big task, but you know what I mean? Yeah. No, it 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 has been discussed um, in terms of essentially level one being we've got these other terms for them level one is we can think of it as a virtual cabinet so it's it's a level that is um um potentially in some ways more useful for the for the curator it allows someone discoverability that a specimen exists and where it is and it someone should be able to find it so it's, <laughs> it's kind of there is a specimen and someone can find it that's great. I mean, that's, that's, you know what I mean? It's very simple, straightforward. If it's level one, it can do this, right? Level yeah. two, level three, that's been hammered out at all? So level two is we think of it as more like research ready. So it's okay. more about, um, okay, someone should be able to do some research about it. So therefore a researcher should be able to find, find a specimen based on the search terms that most researchers would potentially be using. Um, not all, not all the search terms, obviously, but the kind of most common search terms that a researcher would use, they should be able to find specimens. And they should have the information 
attached to that specimen that would allow them to to do the kind of research that most researchers in their discipline would be doing. <laughs> that, that's why it's very, very <laughs> broad. Um, but that's kind of what we were looking at. So it means that, for example, um, we've, this is where we've been trying to um, include something about the quantitative location because a lot of research now is is based on on yeah, I would say it has some kind of mapping of the specimen or some kind of ge geographical location being quite important for the for the research. Um, so that's that's the kind of thinking that we've ha we've been working on. Is it it's the basic research at mid level two, <clears throat> and then mid level three is essentially the open digital specimen or the extended specimen, and that's where mid level three is, and that's the that's the the, the big unknown or the the the. <laughs> not big unknown but um there's still a lot of work to to actually figure out what what would be included within the within the mids level three does that help yes it does because that, that's that's one of the questions i get when i when i mentioned hitman somebody like what does level two and level three really mean if it, what do i expect if i want to find you know if i go find a level two record what can i do with it? that kind of thing the sort of the high level sort of general you know definitions yeah. And I think I think having those in our minds has I think helped focus some of the the thinking about what what would be expected at each level, what kind of information should be should be there. It it is coming from the tag, with the the SCOS mapping. There's a couple white papers, like suggestion recommendations, and we don't have a process for review quite yet. It's just like, hey, this person did it. There's a Google Doc, go review it. We need sort of like a formal process, um, but it, it's going to go through. It'll go through the tag for approval, and then it'll get posted on a new section that just has recommendations. Right now, we have one. We have Boolean values. We need a, more than one. Something more exciting than true or false. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? <laughs> Okay, I've had time to catch up a bit because I'm new to looking at this in detail. Um, line 35, physical specimen ID. If you scroll up a bit. Mm -hmm. um, I think you might want occurrence ID in there. Um, some people who have something like a UUID on their specimens, um, they can put only an occurrence ID. Um, it cheap if used to accept institution code, collection code, and catalog number, um, but that didn't apply to every collection. So some collections only have a current ID, um, Darwin core term. Yeah, that's also why indeed some, because um, with the the application that we made to do do these calculations, um, you also get mid level minus one because there are requirements for mid zero. And some spec some specimens on ZBIF don't meet it, partially yeah. because of that reason. So that is an issue. Um, problem is, of course, if you add occurrence ID in here, then you can essentially remove the element for this mapping at least, because in ZBIF everything has an occurrence ID. Not everything has occurrence ID is a GBIF term, but they do have either an occurrence ID or a catalog number. Other there specimens. Some, yeah, there are other some specimens. Old, old specimen records, especially, oh. might not have the occurrence ID. Um, and some newest ones. I'll see if I can find any some. I thought it was required. I guess through the IPT it's required, but if you publish different ways, it's not. Yeah. Yeah, the old things like digger protocol and bio case, I think you can get around having a occurrence ID. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, is there? Because I'm not completely convinced that we want occurrence ID to be a mapping for physical specimen ID. 
this is going to be the case at the moment, but this may be a place where we want to enforce a bit more rigor because that's not the ideal way to have the idea for the physical thing, not for the occurrence, yes, but for the physical fine. thing. I'm, I'm mostly just checking that you've considered this and not overlooked it. Yeah, that, that's my reasoning, at least, behind omitting it here. And actually, it's not in anywhere else, but uh, that was the idea. But I think... It, but it is interesting, and it's it to some extent it's that um, maybe decision about what people are currently doing and what we potentially want to guide them towards in the future. Yeah. Um, and I think I think probably at the moment a lot of people are putting things like their stable stable URI and things in a current ID. I think. Mm. Yes, I think so. So, and I think this also brings up something, a kind of a bigger um, thing as well. And that is the idea that the, the mid specification, we would expect to, to adapt over time as, as things improve, mm -hmm. as, as, you know, we're trying to kind of like guide people in a certain direction. And it, it may be a process that we would um, tighten up the mid specification over time as 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 people's data get get better <laughs> essentially but, but we, we do also raise the important point i think that i think even regardless of how we do it some specimens on gbif and in other places as well are going to end up not meeting mid zero mm -hmm. we've also seen that in some local disco projects for instance where they did the analysis and they also came up with a level below mid zero because some specimens don't have one of these or one of these properly at least and i think it it's also about all the mids is also about context about where you know, where the the data are that you're you're analyzing and assessing and i think um most commonly i think it it it's probably going to be in GBIF and GO cases is where people are going to be, be um, assessing the, the mids levels. Um, but it's just an awareness, it may not be, it may be somewhere else. Um, but in terms of what we what we've also found when we were when we we're doing some um, testing of of different collections mids levels within GBIF, what we were also finding is that in some cases, the institution were submitting data to GBIF, um, but because of the mapping in the in the in the export or with the with the with the GBIF um, upload, um, it wasn't being mapped correctly, and therefore it wasn't appearing in GBIF, even though the so the institute might be submitting it, but it wasn't actually appearing in the GBIF record. Yeah. Um, and I think things like that are really nice to be able to find, because there are potentially things that can be corrected. Um, so, and very often these these you know mid level zero um, they're things that actually could potentially be be rectified fairly fairly easily. I would say in most cases by an organisation by the institution when they're submitting their data. And I think you, know, I think you're right, Matthias. It's kind of like putting a bar there. I think it's quite a low bar, so it should be it should be achievable. <laughs> so that's an example of a uh, specimen, a preserved specimen that's from a from Imbo. That's Peter Desmond. Um, so he should know what he's doing. And he's only got a, a current ID, although he's formatted it like a institution collection catalog number. Yeah, I, I agree. Maybe I agree you could argue that mm -hmm. you should make the collection code out of that. But there are more cases where there is only an occurrence ID. 
Oh yes, there'll be. Yeah. I haven't counted them. I just have. Yeah. No, I've I've also encountered the. We we do in disco. We also try to start doing the the mids, but we also try to harmonize the data from from different sources and we used also mapping for it. It's not just completely the same as Matthias, because the one for Matthias is really on the calculation part, and this is more on the harmonization part, like which term in the Darwin core archives maps to which term in the um, in the open digital specimen model, which most of the fields are based on the uh, on the MITs. Um, and so far, most mappings we do is based on mapping the uh, occurrence ID to physical specimen ID, because that's the most fitting term. And we now check them by hand. So we, we open one and I create the mapping um, just to see what's in there and how we can map it best. So I think that's, I don't think you can get around having occurrence ID in, in there as a mapping to physical specimen. Yeah, it raises a philosophical question again about Darwin core itself, because in principle, the occurrence is a different thing than the specimen, than what is currently described as the material sample, but that's also evolving at the moment. And so, but in, in practice, if you have a specimen and use that as a proxy for an occurrence, then you're not going to mint an identifier for the occurrence itself, then you're just going to reuse the one you have for your specimen. And that's how it works in practice. So yeah, we have a decision to make on how we look at it. Do we continue and accept that that practice as it is now, or do we want to go a bit further? Well, a bit. <laughs> That's understating it, I guess. Yes, I I, I think also it's a kind of philosophy. This occurrence in GBIF um, is, uh, if we regard a physical specimen, there are sometimes two or three occurrences. If you ha have a, a parasite uh, on a leaf, a rust fungus, let's say, then in GBIF that are two occurrences the occurrence of the rust fungus and the occurrence of the host plant. And um, that perhaps in the herbarium has one catalog number, um, yeah. but um, that in this catalog number are two organisms, perhaps with two unit IDs or whatever, they become an ID in the case they are analyzed or handled with. And in, in GBIF, they have already two IDs. Yes, so, this is really common for things like uh, fish collections. For some species, they stick lots of fish in one jar that that's so another the, case yes <laughs> yes yes mm -hmm. so yes we have this cases also in herbaria yeah N and not only in fish collections mm -hmm. so perhaps uh, if we have catalog number material sample id as a catalog number part, uh, specimen number, uh, variety of, of properties, then we can include all these cases, perhaps. I'm not sure whether this is a good idea to have it open for all kinds of numbers for any units curated in a natural history collection. 
And let's the de definition to the curators. I said, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it is this balance, I think, between um, certainly at the lower levels, mid levels, it's a balance between um, being prescriptive, but not being overly prescriptive, but giving guidance and trying to kind of to bring people along <laughs> a certain direction of travel. Um, I'm not up to date on what the current recommendations are we give to publishers of specimens collections to GB. I can't remember what we tell them about occurrence ID versus catalogue number. In, uh, in the case of Munich, we have, uh, I'm not sure whether we follow the recommendation in GBIF, <laughs> but we have um, in the occurrence ID for GBIF, we have the catalog number as part. We have a, a system where this part unit has an extra ID. It's difficult to explain. Mm. Um, yes, because we have a catalog number or accession number for the whole uh, physical unit. And then we have two part units. And that might in, in fish collections, that might be 10 or even more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But in fish collections, hopefully uh, one species is <laughs> in the in the um, in the jar. I, yes, I think they do that nowadays. I'm sure there's older ones that are yeah. <laughs> more mixed up. Just like so the I, mm -hmm. I shared a link to what the GBIF recommendation is, and it is a Darwin core. I mean, the idea is that best practice would suggest that a current ID should be a persistent, globally unique ID. However, as Matt is alluding to, many people still stick the equivalent of a catalog number in that bucket, I believe. Um, maybe they use something along the lines of the Darwin Ford triplet, but I think there are still some people sticking essentially a six digit number in there or something like that. I, and I think this, it's, a, it's kind of the slight separation between the, the kind of mapping and, and the controlled vocabularies, but I think the, the mapping is, is kind of, to some extent, the more critical, in some ways even more than the controlled vocabularies, because controlled vocabularies, we're going to be really, we're going to hit a lot of those issues with some of the other terms, but I think with, with, with this one, and particularly with the recommendations, I mean, it's really interesting to see what GBIF are recommending and interesting to see, you know, are people following recommendations and what are people actually doing in practice? So the um, Related topic, you know me, I'm always trying to tie all these different pieces together. So this has to do with what does GBIF tell us or what can they know about what you just said? And going back to a metrics conversation with Tim Robertson in like 2017, but going forward, Tim showed a graphic, I think at the recent governing board meeting, and it was looking at the data quality tests. Uh, I think it was particularly for those 27 fields or so where Darwin Core recommends a controlled vocabulary, but he's basically measuring, is the number of times a record has a problem in this field? that they have to report some sort of a surgeon, maybe this is odd or you should look at it. Is that number going down? And, and the, the graphic he can currently say the way he did it, it does show an indication that it's getting better. So 
your question, I think that the specific one there is how can I know that for my collection? How can I know that for my data set, right? Is this getting better? What are my values? Or the other way around is what is the community doing and can we see those values? What, what are they currently doing? So uh, as soon as I asked that, I think Ben, it was you, right? You asked me, can I get those metrics like for my stuff? And, and I just brought that up at the global, sorry, the GBIF North American nodes meeting, which was going on parallel to this one, it's just finished. So all of that related to MIDS. My point is how can somebody at their local collection take advantage of the MIDS levels? Kind of what you were getting at, right? If, if GBIF has a record and it says it's MIDS level zero or MIDS level one, can they get like a, a ping back or something to say, if they want to know, give me back my all my records that are MIDS level zero because I want to work on them? Um, so I'm here because I thought it would be interesting to put MIDS in GBIF, have an additional field in the API, and then shortly after in the on the website telling you for preserved specimens, at least, and fossil specimens, uh, this has MIDS level one or yeah. whatever. Mm -hmm. You'd then be able to search on it. Um, and we'd then be able to, um, like there's already the data set um, page. Mm -hmm. And if you click any data set page and click metrics, it says things like 99% have coordinates. Yep. Um, and we could put 60% you know, MIDS level one. And the, the other the other way around, Matt, if you do that, that I was just talking about in the North American nodes meeting was I have kept pushing where I'm at at Taxon Works for how can we help collection managers and data managers who are managing these giant piles of feedback that come from Jiva, that come from Symbiota, that come from ALA, that come from you name it. They've got all these CSV files they're supposed to process, look at, sort, God only knows. And the pile is just getting bigger in a way. So one of the things that the recent disco, it was a disco meeting inviting different software infrastructures. And Matt, as much as I would, what I would like to see is have some sort of way to automate some of this. Matt's suggestion was as a starting point, he's going to write a script. The script will be generic. So any of your software platforms out there can use it if they like. And what it will do is ping the GBIF API for that data quality information. And we can link it to the record it applies to in TaxonWorks. So then when you're inside the TaxonWorks software, you don't have to go out to GBIF. You don't have to download a CSV file. You will get a ping. You can say, show me all the records in my own database that have this GBIF note or whatever. And you could either click fix all or you could fix one at a time as you wish but you don't have to actually go out. You can use the GBIF API the way it is right now. And so I was thinking of the same thing you're talking about with MIDS. Can you, if you build that into the API, then people could also ping the API the same way. Yes? Yep. Sounds good to me. Sounds like we don't need to do any work. <laughs> Someone else puts it in the collection management system. Yeah. Yeah, well, the, the goal there would be, of course, you, then you could put a metric in place at the starting point at GBIF or at your local collection, and you could start keeping metrics to say, since we've implemented this, is the data quality getting better? Right? Yes. Right. Yeah. And oh, it, means, it means one more thing. It means that in our own system anyway, you'll be able to track who did the work to take those fixes in or assess who did them. So all this thing about credit and attribution and work done will be very trackable as well. Yeah, so indeed part of my um, reasons for making this mapping and putting it up under discussion here is that I think if we, well, actually we, we want that this, something like this gets implemented at Zebra because that's quite useful to have. But to make that possible, we need at least an agreement on an initial full mapping and that then can be implemented in practice. Because that's going to be, in the short term, the challenge. We need to agree on something because DB will have to implement it and that also has some repercussions. 
and I, but I think this is this is where it's it is really interesting because I think um, there's two things, and I think the the one that we've chosen to actually discuss as a useful kind of example of this is with with the physical specimen ID. Um, so when you're looking at GBIF recommendations, for example, the GBIF recommendations are that um, that essentially they're seeing occurrence ID as being the, the 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 place to put the globally unique persistent identifier as it stands. It's of course those recommendations are written for observation data sets as well as collection data sets. Yeah. Um, and I don't think they mention anything about collection, do they? Uh, they they say little bit. Occurrence, allowing the same occurrence to be recognized across data set, for, data set versions, as well as through data downloads and use. Ideally, the occurrence ID is a persistent globally unique identifier. I mean, to me, it sounds the fact that they're trying to kind of recognize this through different data sets is, to me, that sounds like something along the stable URI or... Yes. Um, sounds like that is what they're, what they're, they're guiding people to be putting in there it looks like for to me it it ought to i think meet there's an a ident, an identifier for the specimen it should be just as good as the catalog number by the definition gbif give here um the darwin core definition is is it the same or Uh, you mean for a current study? Yeah, the Darwin Core I one is not think quite. It's, yeah. An identifier for the occurrence in the absence of a globally unique one. Construct one that will most closely make it globally unique. Mm -hmm. That's the Darwin Core one. GBIF's one says it allowing to recognize the same occurrence over time when the data set indexing is refreshed. But that's essentially what catalog number is given a single data set. If it's specimen 23, you you should know what that is forever. Just yeah. the same. Yeah. The biggest problem though is people publish like aggregated data sets, right? All of if they have uh in the INHS in, insect collection, it's actually 12 different collections. So if they want to publish all those together in one giant pile, catalog number won't work, right? Because yeah. it has to be. There's a number 23 in each of those kind of thing, right? Then you have to, have to, uh, you have to do something. Question. But we we take care of that in our local software before it even goes out the door. But that's where the that's where the challenge comes in. For people to create their own, I mean, that's where they kind of get stuck. Because because I, I think essentially what we can we can potentially try and do here is we can we can do some slightly broader mapping. But with the with the idea that we maybe want to encourage and guide people towards a particular mapping, yeah. And it's kind of deciding like what is the what's the ideal mapping, and we maybe put a recommendation to that ideal mapping, or but we, we can allow at this point in time we can also allow a broader mapping, given that not everyone is in in is at that point yet in time. But it, it kind of sounds, what's interesting though, is it, it, it sounds as if we're, are we saying that the ideal mapping for this is, is a current ID? But at the moment we don't have a current ID mapped. <laughs> so I, think that's, I think that's Chibis' view. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't work with the data training, publishing and, and so on. So I'm not certain, but I think that's, um, Cheapest view, and I can't quite remember why we didn't like catalog number, but I think it might be because that could be um, they're more likely just to be numbers, plain numbers, um, and they got changed more because someone might put e something something twenty e zero zero twenty three and then. Later on, they decide they don't want the E and they'll put that in another column, they'll put that in the collection code and all our identifiers change. Um, 
I think the reason to encourage recurrence ID was to say, that's it. It's one thing. It's not necessarily what's written on your specimens labels, uh, but it is what's in your database. I think another aspect of that same point, Matt, is that inside the IPT, if I'm not mistaken, and it's been a while, um, they are in the IPT enforces uniqueness on that occurrence ID field. Yes. You cannot, right? But catalog number, I don't think it has that constraint. Kat, do you, you're shaking your head. Do you I know? I don't, so. I think you can get away with making a boo-boo in the catalog number I field. I think so too. Yeah, I know for a fact that occurrence ID <clears throat> uniqueness is enforced with IPT, but catalog number, I mean, right. I've worked with a lot of IPT data sets and I've never had uh, the IPT spit mm. out an error about- Spit out an error and say, yeah. With yeah. the right. catalog number, but with the right. occurrence ID, absolutely. Yeah. It will I think that's because it's because of these fish jars and herbarium sheets with four yeah. things on, but yeah. they have the same catalog number. Um, and the occurrence ID is distinguishing the, hmm. the parasite from the host on the same sheet or whatever yeah. it might be. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's because the, at its core for GBIF, it's the occurrence that's most interesting. Whereas for the collections, it's the specimen. Yeah. yeah. And also, I think it has to do with the, trying to avoid with the, the curse of the Darwin Core triplet and things that can go wrong with it. Because mm -hmm. that uses catalog number and occurrence ID avoids it. Well, some people are taking the Darwin Core triplet, and I think somebody showed an example of that, and they're using like a UUID as the third part. So that yes, actually that is, that's not bad. That that gets away from that catalog number problem. I didn't so, mean to spend half an hour on this one, sorry. <laughs> I think it's kind of, um, a, a, it's a good exemplar, I think, to, to look at the whole issue of mapping. I don't know, Matthias, is that, am I mean, I can think that it's been useful for? Yes. Of thinking about this mm -hmm. so what, what would be very so what's most interesting for me is to get more insight into how this is happening in the wild so to say so i don't think i'm not familiar at least with any big data analysis that's that happened for g before somebody did this analysis at that level to see how occurrence IDs are being used and in conjunction with other properties to see how recommendations are followed. And it was my hope that MITS would help with that with by mm. applying a number to it. And then you can at least get some more structure into how it's applied. And in the end, we could have a more interoperable aggregated massive data set. I think the I think there was some work done because I know I was uh, I think Alex Hardesty was looking at it with um, Wouter I think um, on the numbers of records that had either a, a triplet or a UUID or a stable URI I think they were looking at what kind of relative numbers people were were using I know because um, I was helping a bit with. The, and and actually Tim did a really nice query on that as well. Um, so that was something that was was looked at. So the, the kind of numbers out there somewhere they've, they've maybe changed since then, obviously. Um, but I guess I guess one question um, is with the um, with the SCOS mapping. I mean, is this is this the kind of thing that you're also looking at in with with that or 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 not? I just have a thought about uh, occurrence ID and uh, specimen ID catalog number. Um, I would, would say catalog number or specimen ID is more basic, mids level zero or one. And occurrence ID is much more for research purposes. If we want it more, um, if we want to find a parasite on, on a leaf and make a molecular analyze, 
then I need the number, uh, the more particular number as a researcher. And this I will get uh, through GBIF. It's more for a part, for a sample, a kind of sample ID. Just thought differentiate between human ID and occurrence ID. Yeah, I think it's just, um, I mean, I, I, you know, as I was saying, I think at this level of, of you know, where, where it's certainly where we're first coming in, which is basically mids level zero, I think the aim was to be to allow kind of quite a broad option. So it could be, for example, a catalogue number would, would be perfectly acceptable. Um, I think the, the mappings that Matthias had was um I'm trying to think was it material sample ID and catalog I catalog number and I've forgotten the other one other catalog number <laughs> yes indeed I've yeah it up again I mean yeah, just I just I guess I, I'm still quite interested in in Ben whether whether this kind of mapping is that is that being is this kind of this kind of thing that that you're do, you're doing with SCOS is that is that or is it a different level that you're working at? I'm I'm looking for so Latimer Core has done this. They have a table in a Google Sheet that shows exactly how they're doing it, and it's the idea is that that's going to be sort of like a, a template. Going forward, can we use a basis for the for the documentation? It's very straightforward. Um, I need to I need to find it. <laughs> um, I, so, there's so much documentation for the collection description. It's here. I know it's here. But there, I think there are five mappings. Um, the, the big question we have at Latimer Core is that when do you borrow a term? Under what conditions? Um, that's still unresolved. I think it's an exact match, but that's still a bit unresolved. Um, but it's basically it, it's really three columns. You have the IRI of your term. You have the mapping. And then you have the IRI, permitted IRI of the target term, and that's it. And then you can put some remarks if you want to, but it's that simple. And it's a layer that sits on top. As Steve explains it. It's, it's a layer that sits on top of the standard itself. But and it can it grows over time. Like if you have a new, a new vocabulary comes out and you want to map your standard to it, you just work down the list and then you could go from there. And then the machine readable parts are on down the line. But that's that's kind of the idea. But a template would be it, it would be helpful for people just to fill it yeah. out, right? You know yeah. what I mean? That's the idea. So I think, and I think this probably takes us to, I'm, I'm going to take us on um, further, if that's okay, Matthias. I think there's, there's going to be a lot to come back to. I think this is going to be the, the next big piece of work. Um, but I think what I'm going to suggest is that we, we move on. Um, and one of the main things I want to kind of move on to is the question in terms of the 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 overall oh but actually before i do i'm also seeing that carlos has his hand up so i'm just going to pause one second yeah maybe i can say something um can you hear me yes we can okay maybe i can say something about uh, the the difference between the catalog numbers and occurrence id um i don't know if i can share my screen but i can try be able to let's see So this this will be um, a catalog record from Miriatrix, the the Scratchpad instance that I um, um. I also only see a blank screen. Carlos, will be yeah, there's it? a there's a lag. I think y'all maybe if we just wait a second. Yeah, I think we maybe have lost Carlos as well. Maybe when he went to share, but because he froze, but it may just be a lag. You see, he's moving again. It's yeah. just a lag. There okay. you go. There. So um, then there is this catalog number here. Mm -hmm. And under that, there is occurrence ID. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And this is basically a GUID, a globally unique identifier. And what I do in Myriatrix is that this catalog number I enter directly. It, it exists physically in the specimen, in the, in the label. Um, but this occurrence ID is generated by the platform. So there, there is a, a generator of GUIDs for several things. And among those, there are spe specimens GUIDs. So basically what one sees inside the platform is just a specimen recording form with several fields and preserve a specimen as basis of record and other options. And then institution code, collection code and catalog number. But the, the occurrence ID is automatically generated. So I would say that a catalog number will always go in a lower level and then occurrence ID is a globally unique identifier or or whatever unique um, code is, is created or generated. And that one could be a higher level. So this, this will be uh, collections that are already digitized and that um, will, will have some sort of maybe automated machine generation uh, unique identifiers. So maybe, maybe the occurrence ID could be uh, mid two, for example. I don't know, depends on how you put it. And that was basically it. There are two things I've noticed with catalog numbers, UIDs, the quids or UIDs are globally unique. That's the, the constraint, right? Every single one's unique across it. And they're machine readable. You can't remember what a quid. I mean, maybe you can, but most people can't, right? Catalog numbers are, they're at different levels. Like it, in my museum, we have catalog numbers are specific to the collection. A lot of, a lot of museums do it where the catalog numbers are unique across the institution. Um, and they're just integers, usually. I don't think anybody uses. I think maybe some people use, well, paleontology likes these letters and things like that. But regardless, it's sort of like, it's not really, you can remember them. It's like specimen 422, right? And it's just a number that identifies that within, but it's not globally unique. It has to be, there are some rules, but it varies widely, whether it just has to be a number or there could be letters and numbers and the format you know, changes, but it's really just within that collection itself to separates things. And I think yeah. that that scope just you know covers it pretty well. Mm -hmm. And Basically, I, I, how catalog numbers become unique is because you try to add two more um, prefixes to that, and then you hope that they are globally unique because of that. So you have the, the global prefix, which we try that is unique, is not unique, and we know it of, of the institution itself. Then we have the uh, collection code, and we know that many institutions will have, for example, MIR as collection code for Miriapoda. So then you lose their resolution again. Uh, and then you have the catalog number. So basically what you hope is that no two institutions will have the same institution acronym while they might share the same collection acronym or abbreviation. And for sure, if, if the numbers start in one and go on, well, there will be similar strings across several institutions. So of course, yeah, I, I ideally every specimen should have or or vial or or collection unit should have a globally unique identifier or LCID or something. Um, but but what I mean in general is that. Some things are generated by humans and exist uh, physically, like these catalog numbers on the labels, and, and they will be in many specimens and, and some collections in most or all of the specimens. So this is a, an information that is very basic for museums and, and will be one of the lower levels. And then you will have museums across the world which are not absolutely digitized or that they don't have the technology behind to, to generate goods or, or some other occurrence ID, which is globally unique. So that's why I suggest that we have the catalog number in a lower level, maybe meets one or something, and then the occurrence ID, which is more technologically advanced, maybe in meets two or something, but always one, one level beyond the catalog number level. Yeah. So, um... So I think, I mean, yeah, absolutely, you know, good points, that, that kind of differentiation between the two, you know, locally versus globally unique. Um, but I think where we've, where we've come to, and this is, this takes us to another kind of aspect of, of MIDS, is in MIDS, we've, what we've 
got is essentially, first off, something called the physical specimen ID, because it's it's not it it's not kind of mapping only to one that exactly to only one thing. It's a more generalized term. So for a physical specimen ID, at, at, as it stands, at mids level zero, we would allow a locally unique or globally unique identifier. So all of all of these different things, and that that was why we saw the mapping that that Matthias had was there was there was different options in terms of the mapping, and those would all be allowed because. And I think this is where we've got to get that kind of fine line with MIDS is the differentiation between data presence versus data quality. And MIDS is more about presence than quality. Um, so it's kind of keep always keeping that in our minds. Um, and that's where I was kind of talking about the, the in some ways, the, the ontology and the controlled vocabularies, which is kind of, to some extent, outside the scope of MIDS. But the mapping is is kind of data quality, but that is actually within the scope of MIDS because we need to be able to measure. So we need to be able to map in order to be able to measure. <laughs> so, and that's where we need to kind of decide, well, where are people putting the information that we are wanting to measure? And I think it sounds like you'd, and this is the thing that we're gonna to have to do, I think for all of these elements, I mean, this is just the one that we've looked at is the physical specimen ID identifier. Um, ID, but I think we're going to have to do the same thing for all these different elements is looking at the mapping so that we can decide whether um, we, how we, how we measure it, essentially. Deb, yeah. yeah, it's interesting, just having not looked at this in a while, but thinking when you say that physical ID, I immediately think local. Right. It makes me think local. And then that makes me think of like the catalog number. How do I find this within the constraints of the space I inhabit where that specimen actually resides? Right. That's what it makes me think of. I, I would not expect people typically to put a UUID in such a thing, but they could. They certain. I mean, I, I get why you that would be. It just depends on your way of thinking and what you've done. Community practices. We've seen all kinds as the community evolves with how they're thinking about applying identifiers. Mm -hmm. But I think this is the key thing is, is what, what are people expecting to see and what we are, what are we guiding people to, to put in there? What's the recommendation? And the recommendation right. is the globally unique persistent identifier. That's the recommendation because that allows someone to find the specimen. It, they, may, they may not, they may have to go into another system to be able to find it. Yep, yep, exactly. <laughs> They've that, got to rely on their database that Carlos was showing us. You've got to look that up in order yeah. to then find it, find it locally. So it just it, it gives you it gives you an in to the to get more information. I think it's more one maybe a way of seeing it. So that it gives you you can then contact that institution because you know the institution. You can contact that institution with a globally unique identifier and say, This is what I want. You know, where where is it? <laughs> can you find it for me? Well, yeah, and I think at the end of the day, I mean, you know, MIDS, <clears throat> you know, the D in med, MIDS refers to digital, like it's a digital specimen. And, you know, your digital specimen, like call me a gatekeeper, it should have a unique identifier. Like it, it should. So, I mean, that's that's kind of my stance here. I, th I think, the, you know, compromising and allowing, you know, the physical specimen ID field to be mapped to, you know, not just an occurrence ID, but also allow it to be mapped to like a catalog number. I think that's a really good compromise because, yeah, like some collections, they might, they just might not be there yet. And that's fair. Like, I don't want to, you know, gatekeep anybody, you know, but I just, I disagree with the idea of, <clears throat> keeping, you know, catalog number requirements lower level and an occurrence ID requirement higher level. Like, I think they should be the same. I think the compromise should be that we should just lump them into the same thing. And I, yes, and I think that's kind of where we've gone with this is we've gone over these more generalized terms, particularly at these lower levels um, to allow that kind of flexibility, if you like. Um, it makes people like Matthias's job more difficult because they've got to do the work with the mapping of these alternatives. <laughs> um, but I think the idea then is that we are coming up with these a different terminology for some of these elements because they're more generalized. And there's there's implications there with, with the whole specification. 
is that we're introducing new terms and and how we manage that that's going to be something that we're going to need, need to be looking at going forwards is is um essentially coining new terminology because we are producing these slightly more generalized terms now where possible we would like to use existing terminology but it's just this awareness that that's something we we need to be thinking about josh yeah oh but you're muted hear. josh could i give a 20 second demo yes just to show oh you. can you hear me now yes we can oh cool i'll let i'll let uh, matt go um just to say what i was doing to show you you know catalog numbers the the gbif data is in google bigquery i think elspeth has used this um and some of these queries like asking what are the fields when well uh, when i'm looking for when there is a catalog an occurrence id but there is not a catalog number some of these queries are quite difficult to do on the gbif api mm -hmm. um but this one takes maybe one two three seconds on the Google thing. And I've got 10,000 examples here of uh, occurrence IDs in the right column. Um, so we can see the different kinds of things people are doing. And I think that might be useful for quite a few of these fields mm -hmm. because there's a big range. Um, and especially if you're only used to uh, plant data or marine data or so on, there's quite different ways of doing things in different communities. Mm -hmm. There we go. That's yeah. all. Thank you. So, Josh, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so, I was just going to say um, one apologies if you hear my cat whining in the background. Um, the, <laughs> the names that we may have to coin, I think there is a certain element of uh, we, we obviously have to be careful but those names aren't going to be used without the context of mids it's not like you're going to see a record with a field and a value and you're going to read the field and have to understand what it means based on just that information it's only going to pop up when you want to find out why your record is only mids level one when you thought it was going to be two and you perhaps look at a report that tells you why it's that level and it tells you oh well for this particular name that we've coined you've not given us the right data and then they would have to look up what that actually means in the context so it's, you're always going to see those names within the context of mids and you're always going to understand what that means because we provided the information to tell you why we've chosen that name essentially so i think we should be careful but i don't think we need to be as careful as you would if you were doing you know writing darwin core or something like that because there's always going to be that context for it that's that is really helpful to to keep in mind Thank you. So I guess one question I've got is keep bearing that in mind. Um, essentially, what we have within MIDS, um, and actually I'm, I'm going to just go into this, go into this, uh, share my screen, um, go into this slide. And I'm going to ask a question to all the people who are currently here. And that question is, given these elements, I know, I know not everyone will be so familiar with them for different mids levels. Does anyone have any objection <laughs> to the, the elements that are included within each Mids level. And Carlos is being brave and putting his hand up. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I have a question. Um, are we mapping mass to something like uh, as has exact synonym? Because um, from other standards, we know that they are using uh, plainly this very simple weight which is very understandable, for example, for ecologists and for biologists. But I know that mass here will also be used for um, geology specimens. So maybe it sounds more comprehensive or scientific or something. But uh, for sure, I can tell you that other standards are already using 
weight. So it's, we can keep it as it is, but it will be good that somewhere in the documentation, there is a mapping that uh, has exact synonym or, or has partial synonym to weight in these other standards. Yeah. This is a suggestion. I think one, uh, you've, you've highlighted something really important, um, and that is the, the input that we really need from the earth sciences. So um, it's something that we're going to be actively going out to, to get. Um, I'm not in a position to be able to map this. I have no idea. <laughs> um, so we need people with the information to know whether are we looking at mass or should we be looking at weight? I think these are really, yeah, absolutely, really important questions. And I think the mapping for this is it needs people from, from the right discipline to be, to be involved and to make sure we get the right terms because we've not we've not yet fi fixed on these terms either yet they're they're kind of working terms at the moment but yeah really good point so um thank you for for raising it because it is something that we've been very aware of that we need to bring in our sciences more and have more contact and more engagement with the our sciences to make sure that this works for them Um, so essentially what we're what we're thinking at the moment is just this is something to put forward is that we're all aware that there's a, a an urgent need for mids to be in place so i think this is a message that's coming through loud and loud and clear um so one option for us is where we are where we've got to with with mids is essentially we've got these these kind of proposals for for mid zero one and two MIDS 3 is going to need a lot more work. So one option is that we actually move forwards more quickly with MIDS 0, 1 and 2, which are the, probably the, going to be the main ones used at the moment anyway. I think not that many collections have specimens at MIDS level 3. Um, so one option is that we move forwards with a kind of um, specification and ratification process um with with the first with mid zero one and two rather than waiting until we've got mids level three so i'd love to get your thoughts on that <laughs> i'm getting a thumbs up from ben in stages and then if there's something major with level one level you know level zero you may want to correct that before submitting level two <laughs> and just keep in mind i always say that John said this, that it's very easy to add terms. It's almost impossible to remove terms. <laughs> so if you don't get to everything right away, that's OK. You can build on it later on and expand to it. But get the core one out there. I think it's important to have you know, that base level sort of to start working with and you know, communication outreach and that kind of stuff. So I think okay. so. OK, so I think, I think given that, obviously, we're still working with the Open, open Digital Specimen Group, and we're still kind of continuing that work. But I think that's essentially one at one side. And I think what we'll do in for the MIDS task group is really move forwards, try and get to the next steps with, with the with these zero one and two. Um and essentially with the with the content as they are at the moment. Um so we'll work we'll work up these these elements. We'll be looking at the mapping. Um, and we'll be looking at the, the definitions and, the, and the, the, the terms that we use. It'd be great to get people's input into that. Um, but this is, this is essentially what we're, what we're going to be working with. Um, we have, a, <clears throat> um, let me just put this along. We've got a, a, a development, um, a specification development in Google Docs just to make it easier to, for to to work in um, together. Um, so this 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 is what we're kind of our our main document. People can work in here. That's one option. Another option is for people to work in the in the GitHub itself, um, where we can be working up these um, the the elements. And I think particularly. 
you know, as we've discussed, the mapping is going to be really critical to be able to measure them. Um, so it'd be great to get some more discussion about that. I know there's going to be some um, additional work on the ABCD um, and Darwin Core, some of them kind of mapping between those as well and the and SCOS. So I think we're, that it'll be great once that's that's coming out. It'll be really, that's going to be really helpful. So I think kind of that's where we are. We're, we're going to be looking at the GitHub to see if we can structure that to maybe create milestones to help us kind of with the next steps and bring those forward so that we can move towards the ratification process. But you know, we need to get everything in place um, first. But I think we do them in stages and let's get let's get mid zero done first. Let's get that done and dusted. Get the mapping sorted out. Um, so that we can we can move on from there. Does that sound? And anyone have any thoughts that they want to add into that? Just aware of the time. But... What's the most up to date current version of the specification? If I was to have a go at implementing bits of it. So the. It's the it's... JSON document, which is nicely seems to have everything, um, which is a little different to the Markdown one in GitHub. And now there's also a, a Google Doc. Yeah, the Google Doc is very much kind of live, kind of let let's let's move to the next version. The 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 kind of most recent um, version of the of the um, look, that's not the that's the old draft is the um is the one in the in the github and we've got the current draft so okay. that, that's um but it, it it doesn't it's it's not it's you know it was done at a point in time um so if we look at here it won't have probably all the information that you need so right, for example, yeah. it doesn't have all the up-to-date mapping so okay. i think i would not use that <laughs> so i think that the, so the, the JSON that I showed is mostly a creation from my part, but it reflects in terms of the elements, the latest discussions that we've had in the group. So it should be quite updated in that regard. But of course, the actual mappings to Darwin Core, those are still mostly my interpretations. That's why I put them up for discussion here today. So that's not something that's accepted by the MIS group or if anything. The elements are the mappings not yeah so we've got some of the mapping in the github elements in the, in the issues that's where you'll see some of the mapping that we've been working on okay um so that's that's probably one of the most up to date one of the most up to date ones and i'm just going to check and what we've got in in Let's just scoot down here to see what we've got in here for the mapping. Um, yeah, it's, we've just got more the, the we don't have the, the mapping in here so much. So I think the I think the ones to use would be these these the GitHub um, GitHub issues issues. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then alongside Matthias's. Jason, I think those two things probably go quite well. Would you agree, Matthias? Um, what we can do is we can um, build in in the Google Doc, and we can start to put in the each of the elements in here with the mapping, and we can get some comments going on in here as well. And that should hopefully reflect with the with the issues. They should hopefully be aligned. So I can work on doing that. Okay, good. Three quarters of the work for me are is about adding any new column to Shivif because there's 15 places it has to be added uh, when it's and the interpretation the actual code to say does this field exist is it correct that's quite simple so um, it's not slowing me down if this isn't quite if this if the small changes or big changes it doesn't really matter that's it's a very simple tests in the end um, okay. 
it won't affect whether this happens this month, next month, or or in the spring. Super. And I think, um, yeah. So, Sam, that would be great if you can just maybe see the mapping. So that'd be that'd be brilliant. Yeah, especially for mid one, I think I can add most of them, and also I think there are a couple EFG mappings which differ a little bit. Like the scientific name for rock specimen is in the uh, EFG part. Um, yeah, I can take a look at it. That'd be super. Cool. So I think that's probably that's probably it. Have I missed anything? Can't tell I me. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think you've missed anything. But just um, I guess you know, a huge thank you for everyone for for coming along. It's been really nice having this this opportunity to have a, a working meeting like this. So. Yeah, really appreciate it. Um, and it's great to get some more people um, coming and um, and engaging with this. So it'd be great if really encourage people to to continue to engage. We're, we're be, we've been meeting monthly. We're looking at maybe meeting more frequently from now just to try and get some of this work done. Um, so we will, um, I would encourage people, there is a, what I've not been able to do is I've not been able to update the the the, the Tadwig Mids website page, um, and that's my my inability rather than anything else. But I I have been advised of where the instructions are, so I will follow the instructions to the letter next time because I I think I failed the first time. Um, what we do have is in the um, in the Tadwig. Um, GitHub in the first page, there is um, a thing in there um, which says to contact how to get in touch and to hear about things. And that is by signing up to the mailing list for the MIDS task group, um, because that's what we use to, to let people know about the meetings and things. So I would really strongly encourage both you to sign up and to um, encourage others to sign up as well to the mailing list so that we can send um, emails out about forthcoming meetings. That would be amazing. Um, so at the moment, the next meeting would be scheduled for the first Thursday in December, and I think that will be the next meeting. Um, so and that would be at 2.30 UTC. Oh, sorry, no, 2.30. This is where we went wrong last time. It's not 2.30. It's 14.30 UTC. <laughs> 14.30, not 2.30. Or 2.30 PM UTC. UTC, yeah. <laughs> time is very tricky. <laughs> um, so that would, that would be fantastic. So um, thanks everyone for for coming along really appreciate it um and would love to see you and and more at the next at the next meeting thank you yeah, thank you yeah thanks oh. thanks everybody i'm just gonna grab the chat because there's some nice stuff in there and stop the recording mm -hmm. and then i'll stop the recording <laughs> All right, I'll let you. I'll let you stop the recording. I was going to do it, but if you're if you're taking charge, I'll, I'll let you. Oh. No, cat. I would be thrilled if you would do it. <laughs> All right, I will click the button because then I won't have responsibility.